Well, thank you, Brother Dave, Sister Jennifer, Kathy, sound team. You guys do an amazing job. Amen? Amen. I'm grateful for them. I really, really am. Boy. Yes, indeed. Um, let me just say also, too, uh, you know, we're still working on the property. We're still going through committees with uh, the land and getting everything done, looking at uh, Plan A and Plan B. So when we uh, finally get to those committees and we get the information we need, we'll convey that to you as well. So I just wanted to let you guys know that we're still thinking about that and we're uh, considering all those things. Also, um, you know, it was interesting uh, that Lottie Moon, when she was growing up, she learned Greek, Latin, Italian, French, and Spanish in school by the time she completed her master's degree. Wow, that's a lot of languages, amen? You know, and she was a prankster when she was young, and she used to tell people that her middle name that was D used to start, uh, meant devil. And so she was a major skeptic of Christianity when she was lost and got saved and got to use her greatly. Uh, also, she was the one that introduced furloughs for missionaries so that they wouldn't get burned out on the mission field and that they could come home for a year. So she also fought for that as well. But let me just say that all the money that is raised for Lottie Moon, and our goal was $3,400, and then all goes into the missionaries' pocket. Every penny of it goes to, the, to their pocket. So let me encourage you to help us meet that goal. Amen? Amen. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let me just say also, man, Brother Bob, man, he does an excellent job in Sunday school. Man, he, great, great. He, he, today, I learned something uh, that I never considered, you know, and he says that God be for us, who can be against us? Well, how does God prove that he's for us? Well, you know, it's a very simple answer, but there's a lot of things you can say, but, man, it's so simple because the fact that God gave us his son, that proves that God is for you. Well, how many of you would give your son or daughter for an adulterer, a pervert, uh, a murderer, or anything like that? You know, I was asked that question when I give my son up for people that were guilty of those things. Would I allow my son to go to prison in place of someone like that so they could go free? And my, I had to be honest, my answer was no. So it just shows you how incredible God's love for us is. Amen? He died for us while we were in the very acts of sinning against him. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So praise God for his love, and that is a whole lot different than ours. Amen? Amen. Um, uh, also, uh, Miss Debbie Dahmer was here last night, and, and some maybe were prepared or not prepared to give a love offering. But we, we typically give an honorarium, but with evangelists right now and, and gospel singers, man, there's this been a big kink in, in their armor, if you will. When it comes to bookings, she's slowly getting booked. John Reed's slowly getting booked, but, you know, they depend on those things. So if you would like to give an offering, we're going to have a plate in the back uh, if you weren't able to give last night. But you feel free not to or are to. That's between you and the Lord. Amen. But we just want to be a blessing to her as she's a blessing to us. So if you have your Bible today, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 12. I was going to come out of Chronicles today, but then the Lord changed my message. And I wrestled with the Lord about this because this is something that's familiar. It's going to be uh, refreshing for some of you. It's going to be a remembrance for some of you. And for some of you, it might be new. But let me just say, you know, as, as oil increases to cogs in a machine, man, so is intercessory prayer for other people. As other people grow in their life, man, sometimes we get stuck. Sometimes we get depressed. Sometimes we, we get what's known as a cash sheep. A cash sheep is a sheep that walks along and gets so much stuff stuff to their fur they get so matted and weighted down that when they lay down they can't get back up and they need the shepherd to come and pick them back up and clean their coat well intercessory prayer for other people is like the oil and the cogs of other people's life it gets the rust off the armor it unshackles things in other people's lives so a lot of the blessings and benefits that you have is because somebody cared about you enough to go to the lord jesus and intercede on your behalf that's one of the greatest things that you can do and have you ever asked Jesus Christ what he wants for Christmas? What does Jesus Christ want for Christmas? We constantly ask ourselves, what do we want and what do other people want? But what does Jesus Christ want for Christmas? And the answer to that question is easy. He wants all of your heart. That's all he wants is your time, your affection, your attention. Amen? And your time spent with him. So let's be reminded. Let's be refreshed because I tell you, God once again reminded me of why. He laid this message on my heart. Because there's one thing I'm desperately praying for. It's unspoken. But we need this. I need this. I need to remind it. So let's go to Acts chapter 12. 
Acts chapter 12, and let's read God's holy, infallible, inerrant, indestructible, awesome word. It's the only book that brings true hope and true help to a life. Amen? The Bible says in Acts chapter 12. I'm sorry. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex a certain of the church. Primarily, in this persecution, it was the leadership of the church. Not the whole church, but the leadership specifically was being persecuted at this time. The disciples, the apostles. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. That means he was beheaded. And because he saw, this is Herod now, because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. So he thought, hey, I've got a big fish here, and I'm not letting this fish get off the hook. Because he saw how James being killed pleased the Jews, he knew that Peter also would be, it would be pleasing to them as well. And then it says, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quadrants of soldiers. 16 to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. In other words, I'm going to bring him forth to the people and cut his head off too. And Peter was in a desperate situation. Peter therefore was kept in prison, and this is the verse we're going to focus on, but Peter was therefore kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in prison, and smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And an angel said to him, Gird thyself, and bind thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him. And he knew not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. And when they were past the first and second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of its own accord. So if anyone claims that they invented the first automatic door, they're wrong. Jesus did. Amen? Amen, amen. There it is. It opened to their own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod. I like what one man said. He goes, you know, it was intercessory prayer that fetched the angel. And it was God that sent the angel. Amen? It was prayer that fetched that angel. Intercessory prayer that fetched that angel to rescue Peter. Boy. And then it says, And the Lord sent him an angel and delivered me out of the hand of Herod. Verse 11. And from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. So the Jews, man, had great expectation for Peter to die. They didn't like the gospel being preached. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, and many were gathered together praying. So now he's coming to the prayer meeting that the church was praying for his release out of prison. So he, now he's showing up to the very prayer meeting where they're praying for Peter's release, and God answered this church's prayer. Amen? And it says, And Peter knocked on the door, and the gate of the damsel came and hearkened named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran and told how Peter stood before the gate. As one man said, it was easier for Peter to get out of prison than for him to get into the prayer meeting. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed it was even so. Then they said, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him and were astonished. They were beside themselves, is what it literally means. And But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and unto the brethren. And he departed and went another place. Now as soon as the day, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers. Uh-oh. What had become of Peter? Now he, he was chained to two guards, had two guards outside of his jail cell, and then he had two other wards of guards to go through. So you could tell, boy, Herod's ticked off. And back in these days, people lost their life immediately if a prisoner escaped, as we're going to find out in verse 19. And when Herod sought for him, he found him not and examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judah and Caesarea and there abode. 
And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. You know, so this right here is a warning to lost people. Man, if, if Christians in a desperate situation. Man, God knew that these soldiers were going to die, and the soul that sins shall surely die, the Word of God says. So, man, they were put in danger. That's why your time is short. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. Don't put it off tomorrow because you may not have tomorrow to repent of your sin and give your heart to Jesus. Amen? And then it says this, And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him. And having uh, blasted the king Chamberlain, their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne, uh-oh, and made an or orientation unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It's the voice of a god and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not glory to God and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Boy, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given to us. I pray now with all my heart that you'll touch me, you'll anoint me, you'll do in me and through me what I cannot muster on my own. And I pray that your word would truly go forth in power. That, Lord, it would revive, it would refresh. Lord, it would be uh, the oil that gets the kink out of the armor, that gets the cogs moving once again in our life. If anyone's rusty spiritually, Lord, I pray that this sermon would truly motivate them and help them, Lord. And I just pray with all my heart, if there's one here today that's lost that doesn't know you, that they would repent of their sin and turn their trust and put all their trust in you, Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for their sins, all of their sins, past, present, and future. And that, Lord, you died and were raised from the dead. You tell us in your word, if a one, one is willing to repent, surrender their life, their heart to you, calling upon your name, believing in their heart that God raised them from the dead, that, Lord, you will save all those that call upon you. And I pray that one would do that today that doesn't know you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a boy named Grayson Clamp in 2013. Uh, he was born deaf, and they tried to put those cochlear implants into his, his ears, but they didn't work. And so some university uh, doctors from North Carolina got together, and they put a nerve into his ear from some other part of his body. And on 2013, man, the nation watched this little boy hear his father's voice for the first time. Boy, his face lit up when he heard his father speak. And let me just tell you this. Man, God's face lights up when you come to him and when you speak to him. When you hear your father's voice, man, it should just bring joy to your heart, but also it brings joy to him. Amen? We need, when you, you think about a, a relative that you love with all your heart that lives far away or a good friend, and when you hear from them, don't you rejoice in hearing their voice? Amen? Well, the Lord's the same way. He rejoices over us, the Word of God says. So you need to understand that, man, God takes great pleasure in spending time with you and spending time with us. Amen? Amen. Hudson Taylor, he had a desperate prayer. He was a British missionary to China, and back in, I think it was 1909, he was on his way to China, and all of a sudden the wind stopped. Everything went completely the opposite direction of what they needed to happen, and what was happening was their ship was beginning to drift close to this submerged reef that wrecked many other ships. But the problem was, and this is the true story, the islands that they were drifting to were full of cannibals. In fact, they said they saw the cannibals on the shore building fires in expectation of their, crip, of their ship crashing into that sunken reef. He said there's four Christians on board. He got them together and said, we need to pray. And boy, they prayed a desperate prayer, and they asked God to send wind. When he got up back on board, he went to the first mate and said, hey, listen, let down the sails. And the first mate said, well, what good is that going to do? We've done everything we could possibly do. Even the captain has said that to you. Well, the one thing we didn't do was pray, and that's what we just did. And God has laid on my heart that he's going to send a wind, and I believe that he's going to do it. So they let the sails down, and within a few minutes, man, the wind began to blow. And they were desired to their desired haven, which was China. And this is what he wrote after God delivered them from man, that, that, that serious situation. He wrote, Thus God encouraged me, ere landing on China's shore, to bring every variety of need to him in prayer and expect that he would honor the name of the Lord Jesus and give help in each emergency required. Amen? Boy, he's the same God today, yesterday, and forever. He'll do the same thing for Hudson. He'll do the same thing for you. He did the same thing for Paul, the Apostle Paul. He'll do the same thing for you. Amen? Amen. Now, intercessory prayer. Man, the oil that gets into the cogs of other people's lives that help free them. Man, give them the necessary power that God brings, the necessary provision that God brings. Whatever they need, whatever they're lacking, 
Man, it's intercessory prayer that's going to get the job done. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, I exhort you therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of things be made for all men. Did you hear what God said? God wants supplications, prayers, and intercessory prayers be made for all mankind. That means your worst enemy. That means the person that you can't stand the most right now, that you may even have ill will towards. God says that they need prayer. If you can't pray for them, then you need to pray at least for their salvation. Amen? Because they also need to be saved desperately. A lot of people quit praying for people because they're ill. They have unforgiveness. And it's those people that put themselves in prison. Now, I'm not saying forgiveness is easy, and I'm not d diminishing anybody's pain or tragedy or heartache or what horrible thing they've gone through. I'll never do that. But the Word of God teaches us that we need to be forgiving. And God can help you do that. Amen? Amen. Now, the highest form of prayer for a lost man is when they get on their knees and ask Christ to save them from their sins and from his wrath. But the highest form of prayer that a Christian can pray, I believe, is intercessory prayer. It's the highest privilege that a child of God has. Man, it's the highest form of worship that we have. Man, it's prayer. And prayer is simply talking to God. Amen? Amen. Listen, your prayer can do anything that God is willing to allow it to do. Because we've got to pray in his will. Amen? Amen. Amen. We, he's, he's not the genie that we just name it, claim it, nab it, and grab it, and God's obligated to do anything for us. No. That we pray according to his will, he hears us, the Bible says in 1 John. Amen? Amen. So we have to pray according to it. But listen, your prayer can do anything that God's willing to let it do. Joshua prayed that the sun stand still when he was fighting the army. And what has to take place for the sun to stand still? Man, the earth has to quit rotating. God let the earth quit rotating for a man's prayer. And the sun stood still, the Bible says, all day. It did not hasten to go down. Now, what a prayer. And Spurgeon said, when you put your hand on prayer, you're putting your hand on the very lever that can alter the universe if God so decides to answer your prayer that way. Amen? Wow. Now, the Bible says there is nothing impossible with God that he can abundantly, exceedingly do more than you can think or ask. In the Greek, it means over the top, over abundantly, overflowingly do more than you can think or ask. Our God is an awesome God, and the Bible says our God is able. Amen? Amen. So the truth of the matter is, if we're honest, me including, we spend probably more time praying for ourselves than we do for each other. I hope that's not the case. Now, prayer. We have to pray believing. We have to pray in his will. We have to pray in his name. We have to pray walking in his commandments, making sure that our sins are confessed for him to order, for him to answer our prayers. Amen? Now, there's some prayers that are not pleasing to God in a Christian's life. Oh, God taught me that in Korea. I remember I was on my knees and I was praying over different things. And the reality was, I was just wanting to get through it. I was wanting to get through it. Lord, look at me. I prayed. I read. I was in that checklist mode. Check, check, check. I came to church, check, without my heart really being in it. And I remember my fan blowing my Bible. I could hear my pages blowing as I was praying. And all of a sudden, my pages stopped for some reason. And when I opened my eyes, I looked directly at this verse and I wrote it down. Hosea chapter 7, verse 14. This is the word that God gave to me when I was praying half-hearted. And they have not cried unto me with their heart when they howled upon their beds. They have not cried to me from their heart. An intercessory prayer is a prayer that comes from the heart. Not half your heart, not 99% of your heart, but 100% of your heart. Amen? Now, the technical term for the word intercession means to approach a king on behalf of another and plead that person's case. That's what it means. And when we approach the king of kings and the lord of lords and we ask for something not for ourselves but for someone else, when you're interceding for them... You're doing exactly what God has told you and commanded you to do. Listen to what Philippians 2, 4 says. Look not everyone on his own interest, but everyone also on the interest of others as well. Amen? So this early church in the book of Acts is going to teach us some valuable lessons and man, give to us, remind us, refresh us of what good intercessory prayer is and what intercessory prayer is acceptable to the Lord. Now, a wave of new persecution has come to the church. Herod Agrippa, who is the grandson of Herod the Great, has taken James. Verse 2 says he killed him. 
Herod sees that it pleases the Jews so much that he arrests Peter. Now he's at 14, 14 guards, or 16 guards, 24 hours a day according to the Greek. He's being watched. He's got a big fish. And the Bible says uh, that verse 4, there were four squads, so that's how we know that. So the picture that God paints for us is a picture of Peter that, as far as the world's concerned, as far as the saints are concerned, he's in a desperate, gloom and doom situation, man. Peter's going to lose his life. Now, you remember that when they were in that storm in the boat, there was only one man that prayed, and that was Peter. And there was only one man who had a supernatural walk with God because he prayed. And when he prayed, he was able to walk on water. He was able to go and do things that nobody else was allowed to do because they didn't pray to the Lord, but Peter did. So when we pray, God moves. Then the Bible says, you have not because you... So in other words, as Spurgeon said, I like what he said, when man, your tongue moves, heaven moves. When your tongue stops, heaven stops. That's the way God designed it. That's the way God put it in, 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 in his plan. Amen? Why do we pray? It's certainly not to inform God of what we need. He already knows what we need. Amen? So we're not praying to inform God of anything. We're not praying to let God know about our situation and what we're desperate for. No, he, he knows that a million, billion, infinity times better than all of us put together. Amen? But we pray because he has the right answer for the situation that we're in. He has the best answer, the right answer, the only answer. Amen? To help us in those situations. So prayer teaches us how dependent we truly are on the Lord. Amen? Amen? Boy. Peter's probably going to die just like James did. And the Jews were excited about it. But thank God this church got together, used the most powerful weapon known to man, and that's prayer. More than all the nuclear bombs put together, man, prayer is more powerful than that, according to the Word of God. So this church began to intercede, and not only did it bring hope and help, but ultimately, in this case, it brought deliverance to Peter because they prayed. Now, I want to dissect verse 5 because it's going to teach us what intercessory prayer should look like in our lives. Now, look at verse 5 before we dive in too deep. It says, Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. No, I thought about that. He was kept in prison for what? For sharing the gospel, for doing nothing wrong but doing what Jesus told him. But Peter was in a physical prison because of the cause of the gospel. But by way of application, I couldn't help but think that there's a lot of people that are in spiritual prison. Oh, there's a lot of people around you that you know that are in spiritual prison, the prison of wicked habits, the prison of selfishness, the prison of pride. And everybody that's lost is desperately in the penitentiary of sin. And they need intercessory prayer because a lost man is not going to just wake up and pray for himself. Amen? Boy. Hebrews chapter 1, 12, verse 1. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin, the sin which so easily entangles us. It literally means in the Greek that every person has one particular sin that they're the weakest at. And Satan knows what that is, and he's going to tempt you with that probably more than any other sin in your life. But the Word of God says in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 22, His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with, his, with the sins of the cords of his own sins. Boy, people need prayer. Amen? There's a whole world of people out there in prison that are going to hell, and they're asleep just like Peter was. And the church needs to wake up, sound the alarm, and keep preaching the gospel, keep telling people to witness, keep telling people to be soul winners. Amen? So if Christians that are struggling with various sins in their life, maybe they're shackled up, maybe they're just, man, bogged down with depression, maybe they need God's provision, they need God's peace, they need God's power, they need God to move, they need a miracle in their life, whatever it may be, whatever it may be, Intercessory prayer is what's going to get the job done. Amen? Now notice verse 5 again. Let's dive in now. Peter therefore is kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing. Without ceasing. So the first element that God tells us that makes up good intercessory prayer that's pleasing to him is desperate prayer. Intercessory prayer, they prayed desperately. This church got on their knees and they were praying desperately for Peter's release. Boy. I heard a good definition of what desperation is. A man said, a person drowning is a good desperation. What's he in desperation for? Watching the football game? How much money is in his bank account? The new addition on his house? How many friends he has or doesn't have? What is he desperate for? Air. He's desperate for air. Everything else has lost its luster. And when this world loses its luster... And when we begin to intercede for people, man, that's when we know we're praying desperately. Amen? Boy. 
As breathing is to the body, so is prayer to the soul. Wow, listen to what Jeremiah chapter 29 says. Desperate prayer that's going to really hit the heart of God is going to come from your heart. That's why the Bible says to love the Lord your God with what? All your heart or just 99% of it? All your heart. All your heart. Listen to what Jeremiah 29, 13 says. And you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Psalm 119, verse 10. With my whole heart I have sought thee. Have you sought God with your whole heart lately? Psalm 42, verse 1 and 2. As the deer panteth after the water brooks, panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. Does your soul thirst for God? One man said the problem with most people in church is that they don't pray in desperation. He went on to say, God hears the prayers of desperate Christians. Another man said the situation in the church is absolutely desperate, but the saints, in most cases, are not. Ouch. When a church quits praying, a church quits breathing. Amen? Let's go back and look at the predicament Peter was really in. How else could Peter get out of prison? There were no advocates in the city that would take him up. There wasn't a bail set. And if anybody did, they probably knew that Herod would take their life or even trying to get Peter free. It would have been no good for them to start a riot or bribe people because that would be sin to do that. And the Roman soldiers would have squashed that like, like, like white on rice just that quick. They didn't have tanks and bombs. They didn't have the CIA, the FBI, or special ops to get him out of prison. Hmm. So from a human standpoint, everybody was looking at an impossible situation. All their options were completely exhausted. Amen? Boy, listen to this. I learned this from a guy. He says, and the only option was prayer. And when we realize that the only option we have is prayer, that's when things are going to really get done. Because a lot of times we'll turn to other people before we turn to God for help. Man, man, but then the bottom line is, man, prayer. You have not because you... And you have not because you ask a miss. You ask a miss and want to spend it on your own pleasure. Sometimes God says, no, you got to do it for my glory. Why were they praying? And they, Lord, and Peter's put in prison because he was sharing the gospel. He's in there, man, by false means. He's being falsely accused. He's going to lose his life. And Lord, we know he was in there because he was preaching the gospel. And we know that when he gets out, he's going to continue to preach the glorious, everlasting gospel. Amen? Amen. So they were praying. And we can see that they were praying desperately because look at verse 5. But prayer was made without ceasing. Now, desperate prayer is made up of two elements. Let's look at what the elements that make up a desperate prayer are. First of all, it's made up of steadfastness. You see the word ceasing there in verse 5? It means continually. It means constantly. Now, verse 3 says, these were the days of unleavened bread. The last part of that verse in verse 4 says, after Passover to bring him forth to the people. Now, Passover... And unleavened bread were two distinct ceremonies, but they were used synonymously together. How do I know? Because Luke 22, verse 1 says this, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. So what does that tell us? That tells us that this church could have been in prayer constantly for Peter up to eight days. Now we don't know. The Bible didn't give us the day that they started to put, or he put, was put in prison. But we know based on, based on the feast, that he could have been in prison for up to eight days, and this church ceased night and day not to stop praying for Peter. Wow. Wow. Spurgeon was asked why God moved so powerfully in his church. He was a famous preacher back in England, and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands were saved under his preaching. And they thought that he was going to give some brilliant preacher answer, and he said, I'll tell you why God moved so powerfully in our church. And he marched these reporters down to the basement. He goes, I want you to look in that door, the window of that door. And he looked in the window of that door, and they saw about 100 people on their knees and said, this is our prayer room. This is the prayer engine of our church. It really is the engine, the motor that drives our church. And these doors, this basement is open 24 hours, and this basement is continually filled for 24 hours with people praying. Wow. Taking shifts to do it. Listen to this. People in the Old Testament, man, they give us the example of what desperate prayers and God answered their prayers. Man, 1 Samuel chapter 1, Hannah was praying for her son, and it says, And it came to pass as she continued praying. Colossians 4, 2, continuing in prayer. 
First Corinthians, or First Chronicles sixteen eleven. Seek the Lord in His strength. Seek His face continually. Matthew 7, 7, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Now, all of these are verbs in the present tense. So what it literally means in that verse is keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. Keep on doing it. Keep on coming. Don't stop. If all we do is pray for the loss for this church once a week on Sunday morning, then we're in trouble. George Mueller, he was a famous man for prayer. He was most known for his orphanages. Never asked for a penny. Always prayed about the situation. And wanted, his own desire was to show how God could truly meet the needs of people without asking for a penny, man. And God blessed those four orphanages till the day he died. They say when Mueller was 75 years of age, he was still preaching. And while preaching on prayer, he said this. For the last 57 years, I've received over 30,000 answers to my prayer on the same very day that I prayed them. Let me ask you a question. Has God answered your prayer in the same day? He has mine. Amen. Boy, he, he'll do it for you too. For the last 57 years, he said, I've recorded over 30,000 answers to my prayer on the same day I prayed. Oh, wow. He also said in that service, sometimes it was a week, a month, or a year before I would get an answer to my prayers. He said he prayed over 20,000 times. He recorded over 20,000 times he went to the Lord in prayer before God answered one of his prayers. 20,000 times. Then he began to cry as it was told. He said there was one prayer request I've been praying for for 40 years that God still hasn't answered and I'm not going to give up till he does. And most people believe that he was praying for a lost friend. And when he died, George Mueller died, that lost friend that he'd been praying for for all those years came to know the Lord. As scholars put that together, much smarter than myself. But I thought that was interesting. But praise God, we don't have to compare ourselves to other people. We have to compare ourselves to Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. We need to see prayer as our first resource and not our last resort. Well, Brother Dave, my prayer life stinks. I find it hard to pray. I like what Spurgeon said. Well, then you need to pray to pray. You need to go to God and say, Lord, my prayer life stinks. I need you to help me with my prayer life. And he'll do it. Amen? Man, he gave his son for you. Man, how, how desperately does he love you? He's not rejecting you. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 4, 16, I mean, even when you're at your worst, what does God say? In Hebrews 4, 16, come boldly into the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. We need God when we're in sin the most, and yet he says, come boldly, because he loves you that much. Amen? Now, not only did he pray steadfastly, but he also prayed seriously. He prayed seriously. That's the second element that makes up desperate prayer. Look at, look at verse 5. See the word ceasing there again? Not only does it mean continually, but in the Greek, it means to stretch or strain. It gives the idea of intensity. Boy, this was a serious prayer. They weren't playing games when they got on their knees with God. Then they were desperately wanting to see Peter released. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he was praying, let this cup pass from me. And he, he, the Bible says that he sweated like, as it were, great, great glops of blood. That's a desperate prayer. And that's a steadfast, serious prayer. Amen? Boy, James chapter 5, verse 16, confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another. For the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. Wow. And the Bible says in Ephesians 6 that we're to pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. So that word effectual there in that verse, James chapter 5, that effectual, fervent prayer. Effectual means energetic. The word fervent there means boiling hot. So what kind of prayer affects the heart of God? Well, he tells us in the book of James, that which is energetic, enthusiastic, boils over from a this intense desire, an inward desire to see the power of God move in your life, move in other people's lives. John Knox, when he was approaching Scotland, said, Lord, give me souls or I die. He was desperate. George Whitfield, before he preached, would say, give me souls or I die. He said the same thing. If we want to see lost souls come down these aisles and Christians freed and empowered, we need to be a church that prays desperately, steadfastly, and seriously. Amen? But number two, let's move on. Not only is an intercessory prayer made up of desperation, being steadfast and being serious, but number two, and Intercessory prayer is a defensive prayer. 
Oh, it's a prayer of defense for yourself and for others. Look at verse 5. But Peter therefore was kept in prison, but what? But prayer. Do you see that? Notice the text does not say they went up to their high political friends and they bribed everybody and greased all the politicians and, man, caused a revolt. Does it say that? It says, but prayer. See, this church said the only way we're going to stand up and fight for Peter is on our knees. One man said the tallest churches in America are churches that are on their knees. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, listen to this. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So if you've got a problem with somebody, your problem's not really with that person. Your problem's more so with Satan who's using that person. He's the real culprit behind the scenes. Listen to what it says. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So in other words, defense of prayer, number one. Why do we pray defensively? Why do we pray intercessionally for other people? Because defensive prayer defies the opponent. It defies the opponent that comes up against you, whatever that opponent may be. It could be finances. It could be trouble with your boss. It could be trouble in your marriage. It could be trouble with the son. It could be trouble with anything. But it's intercessory prayer defies the opponent. How do I know? Because we're going to look at it. You see... They knew that the opponent behind the scenes wasn't Herod himself. He wasn't the main problem. He was a puppet being used as Satan. So Satan himself was the real culprit behind the scenes trying to stop the gospel. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So this church said we're going to have to fight on a different stage because Herod is not the main problem. Satan is. Boy. And he's a whole lot bigger than we are. We need prayer. We can't. We, man, what, they, t tell me one sheet that has a chance against a vicious wolf. A defenseless sheep, even two or three, put two or three in there. Let's, let's put four sheep in there against one wolf and see who comes out winning. Man, the, man Satan's a big bad wolf. Man, look at, look at what he did in, in Nazi Germany at the Holocaust. Man, that was Satan just getting started. He is not your friend, amen? He's your foe. Boy, and my friend, it's going to be prayer that puts a defense around us, a defense around other people. That defies the opponent. Boy. Ephesians 6.10. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Why? Because we're in a battle. Listen to this. Put on the whole armor of God. Why do people put on armor? Because they're going to do what? Go to battle. Boy. Verse 18. The same passage says, Praying always with all prayers in the Spirit for the saints. So prayers are part of the armor that we put on. This passage teaches, don't miss it, we're going to have to pray to do battle, but we're going to have to do battle not with fleshly means, but man, by the power of prayer. Man, the church prayed defensively. Satan was on the offense. This church said, fine, we'll get defensive. They prayed desperately. They prayed defensively so that God would move to interrupt the plans that Satan had for Peter. Boy. Jesus took up a defensive prayer when Satan wanted to sift Peter like wheat. Jesus said, Peter, I prayed for you. I interceded for you because Satan's wanting to tempt you. He desires to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. Amen? So not only does defensive prayer defy the opponent, man, you remember King David? Boy, King David fought who? One of the biggest opponents in all the Bible, Goliath. Man, did, did, not, did not that defensive prayer that he prayed, man, the Lord, he said the battle is the Lord's. Man, you defy the armies of the living God, you uncircumcised Philistine. And when you pick the fight with Israel, you pick the fight with God. And I've got news for you. God has never lost a fight yet, and nor will he ever. Amen? Amen? And boy, he cut that giant's head off. One man said, the last thing that went through Goliath's mind was nothing like that's ever entered into my mind before, that big rock. Amen? Man, when the children of Israel on top of, when Moses went to the Mount Sinai, and they all begin to build that golden calf, what did God tell, the children? What did God tell Moses? Move aside. I'm going to destroy them all. I'm going to wipe them off the planet. But man, that man got desperate. And that man got defensive in his prayer. And the whole nation of Israel was delivered and saved by that one man's prayer. Don't tell me in sinners' prayer doesn't work because it does. Amen? Boy. What were the odds from the world's point of view of Peter getting out of jail? I think it would be safe to say that Peter was toast. 
The odds are completely against us in this life. The odds say that, man, listen, you're going to be tempted several days every day of your life to sin. Man, the odds say that, man, half the people getting married are going to end up in divorce. And on and on we can go with all the odds that are against every Christian, born-again Christian on this planet. Man, we're in a world that is against us. Our flesh is against us. Satan's against us. Boy, we have a lot against us. But praise God, he is for us. Who can be truly against us if he's for us? Amen? Boy. Wow. You remember Elijah? He took on 850 liberal preachers. Remember that from the grove? When he called fire down on Mount, Mount Carmel, remember that? Boy, he prayed, and God answered that intercessory prayer. And we know that he was a Baptist because only a Baptist preacher would take on 850 liberals. Amen? Boy. The person that you think will never get saved, intercessory prayer says they can. Then Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. If God can save the chief, he can save every other Indian there is. Amen? Amen. Boy, Hebrews says that he is able to save them to the uttermost. We must be a church that prays defensively for the power in the pulpit. Man, the power of God to move in the pews. Or as one dear brother said that I know, Wayne Turner, he says, if we'll not survive and thrive in the 21st century, if we're not a church that gets on their knees. So they prayed desperately. They prayed defensively. But number three, number three, they also prayed dependently. They prayed depending on God to answer their prayers completely. Look at verse 5. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto who? Unto God in verse 5. So dependent prayer was done. It was made up of two things. Verse 5 says, of the church. And verse 12 says, the last part, many were gathered together praying. So this church was depending on God completely as a whole. So this church dependently prayed for God collectively. Lord, we as a collective group are getting together. We're joining forces in one and we're praying very specifically for Peter's release. So they prayed collectively. They were dependent on God to do it. Now, dependent prayer is done collectively with God's people. When one person prays, that's great. But when two, three, or four begin to pray, that's even better. Amen? Have you ever been moving something really heavy? Boy, you wish that somebody was there to help you kind of push that along. Well, I remember, I think I've told the story, but I ran out of gas in my Volkswagen. My gas gauge didn't work, and I was just too lazy to go get it fixed. Dumb me. Boy. Well, I ran out of gas, and I was trying to push it to the gas station, and all of a sudden, my car got real light, and I felt like, man, I, hey, I'm stronger than I thought. Well, I didn't realize that three old boys got out of a truck and were helping me push that car. <laughs> but that heavy load, we got a lot lighter because other people were helping pray. Amen? So we got to pray collectively sometimes as the church as a whole, collectively. Second Chronicles 7, 14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. They pray collectively for Peter. Boy, dependent prayer is done collectively. But also, dependent prayer is done completely. Boy, not only collectively, but they were completely depending on God. And God alone to take care of this problem for them. Verse 5 says, Of the church unto God. This church knew who to go to to depend on, and they were asking God for the impossible because they knew with God nothing is impossible. Amen? Boy, let me ask you this. Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Did you hear what he said? And delight yourself in him, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. He loves you today. Amen? Boy. God hung the stars, did he not? God made the universe in six days, did he not? He killed over 180,000 Assyrians with one angel in the word of God, did he not? Boy, he did. He used a teenage boy to kill a giant, did he not? Here's what blows my mind about myself and others sometimes. No, we'll trust God to save our eternal soul from hell. But boy, we'll struggle to trust God with that light bill or with that problem kid, or that problem grandson, or that problem grandchild. Boy, we trust them with our eternal soul, but boy, we struggle to trust them with everything else. And yet the Bible says, listen, and I've given you everything. I've given you the Lord Jesus Christ. What else could God give you that was greater than that? Amen. So everything else that you're asking for pales, pales in comparison to who Jesus is. 
Amen? Boy. George Mueller, that famous preacher again, let me just tell one more story. Started an orphanage for many kids, but one day they had no food. Maybe you heard this story, but it's a famous one. Had no food, and he said, all the kids, I want you to put the tables and the plates out there, silverware, get it all set up, boom, no food at all. Kids knew there was no food in the refrigerator. He asked one of the kids to pray. And the kid looked at George Mueller and said, well, man, there's, there's no food on the table. And the Lord said, well, or, or Mueller said, well, the Lord has not seen fit to bring it by yet. He just hasn't brought it yet. So let's pray and thank God for the food that he's going to deliver. So they prayed, asked God to bring food. And they sat there for about five or ten minutes waiting. All of a sudden there's a knock on the door. True story. Knock on the door. Milkman was there and said, hey. Points back at his carriage and says, yeah, my wheel fell apart. I've got cheese, I've got bread, and i got milk, and it's all going to spoil. Do you think you can use it here? Come on, man. You know the, the Lord sent down that angel to kick out that spoke, amen? Right in front of that orphanage? Boy. What did they do with my glasses? <laughs> Boy. Pray and hide. You ever heard of pray and hide? They called him camel knees because his knees were so callous because he was on his knees so much. They called him camel knees. 1908, he prayed, Lord, give me one soul a day. Let me witness to one soul a day. And by the end of 1908, 1400 got saved. He got desperate again and said, Lord, in 1909, I believe you for two souls a day. And at the end of 1909, 1,800 individuals got saved. In 1910, he got on his knees. I've seen you move twice, and I'm believing you to move for four souls a day. And at the end of 1910, 1,600 souls got saved, and he died in 1911. Wow. Wow. We got them. We wrap it up. They prayed desperately. They prayed defensively. They prayed dependently. That's what makes up a good intercessory prayer. But there's one more element that makes up a good intercessory prayer, and they prayed distinctly. They prayed distinctly. Look at verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church under God. Now notice those last two words. For who? For him. They prayed distinctly. They prayed specifically. They didn't say, now Lord, we want you to bless that saint down there in that prison. Just hey, let him go. Did they, did they, did they, is that how they prayed? No, they prayed by his name. They used distinctly. They used Peter's name. They were praying specifically. Amen. I know what Charles Spurgeon said. He's my favorite preacher, by the way, if you, have, if you haven't figured that out. He goes, but when archers are on a wall back in the medieval days and the army was approaching, he goes, how many archers on that wall just took their bow and just shot it straight up in the air hoping they would hit somebody? What do archers do with an arrow? They aim. Man, intercessory prayer is not prayer that's just, Lord, bless the church. Oh, Lord, bless all the saints. Oh, Lord, bless, bless them with what? Bless the church with what? you got to be specific. They aim specifically. Your prayer's got to be like an arrow right at the heart of God. you got to aim specifically using names, being very specific. Hey, I prayed for a car. I said, Lord, I, I, I need a car for seminary. Here's how much money I have, and there's no way that I'm going to be able to afford one with this. Well, my brother was a painter, happened to see a car under a tarp for sale. This lady's this lady, husband just died who was a pastor. Or not just died, but had died a little while back, had been a pastor when she was a widow, and had that car, never used it. And my brother told the story that he was looking for a car and wasn't even really interested because the probably car was going to be too much. Well, and after he told her I was going to seminary and all that, she goes, you know, my husband would want a seminary uh, called man to go to seminary, be a preacher. I'm going to give you that car for this much money. Man, it was the money that, the amount that I had. Man, boy. It was a Royal Brome, that good old Detroit iron, four-door, big old engine. That's back when gas was 85 cents a gallon, amen? <laughs> and I, I'm so, man, my wife, too, man, she had to drive around that big old tank, too, man. I said, well, one good thing, we're protected a lot better, right, amen? <laughs> Boy. But now let me just wrap this up. They prayed desperately. They prayed defensively. They prayed dependently. They prayed distinctly, very distinctly. And as a result of all that, it brought deliverance. Boy, it brought deliverance. How do I know? Now, look, 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 look what this prayer did. Look what the oil 
of this prayer did and the cogs that were all bound up with rust and junk in Peter's life he was shackled and this oil this prayer this intercessory prayer man loosened all that up first of all it brought Peter pardon that he got out of prison amen how do I know look at verse 7 the Bible says the chains fell off verse 10 says the gate opened automatically so it brought pardon but it also brought peace to Peter and did you notice that the Bible says that Peter was sleeping and the angel had to smote him on the side to wake him up? Who can sleep knowing that you're going to get your head cut off? Man, he gave Peter peace. Boy, it did. What else did it do, Brother Dave? Well, it brought God's presence. Look at verse 7. The light shone in the prison. Then the Bible says that God is light. The Bible says his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. You know, the angel had that shine, that glory of God shining in that prison. It brought the presence of God. It brought the deliverance of God. But also it brought praise and wonder and glory to God. Look at verse 17 and 16. They were astonished, literally beside themselves. Look at verse 17. But beckoning unto them with his hand to hold their peace. And it brought praise. It brought wonder. It brought glory to God. Man, are you serious? God sent an angel and let the chains fall off of you? And you got past 16 guards without them waking up or knowing anything happened? Man, God is awesome. He abundantly, he exceedingly did more than we could ever think or ask in this situation. Amen? But it also produced faith. It produced faith in others. Look at the middle of verse 17. He declared unto them how the Lord, how the who? Did he, did, he, did he brag on himself? Did he brag on the church and all the saints that were praying? Who did he brag on? The Lord. Man, boy, let's not miss that. And he declared unto them how the Lord brought him out of prison. And he said, go tell these things unto James and the brethren. Church, we must intercede on behalf of this world, ourselves, and every other saint that's on this planet. Amen? This is a whole lot easier to preach than to live. Oh, it's easy to preach. Very easy to preach. But is there anything you're desperate about? Because there is something I'm very desperate about that I need prayer for. And I'm sure that you've got some desperate prayers in your life as well. So let's ask God to help us all, strengthen us all, be reminded of how important prayer really is. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. As the piano plays, will not tarry. We're going to stand to our feet here in just a minute. These altars are going to be open. Maybe God's laid on your heart today that you're lost and that you're in desperate need to repent of your sin. Turn from sin. Stop sinning. And turn to the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. Have you fully surrendered your heart, your life to him? Have you said, Lord, I'm coming to you, surrendering all of me to all of you? That means you're going to tell me where to go. You're going to tell me what to do. You're going to tell me where to be. You're going to tell me what job to get, what school to go to. And you're going to tell me the girl or man to marry. Lord, you're the Lord of my life. You're the master of my life. Have you surrendered your heart fully to him, repented of your sin, and trusted him? And the Bible says that you're saved by grace, God's unconditional love. Through faith. That means trusting in God's word. You're saved by grace through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works. At least anyone should boast. Jesus said in Mark 1, 15, repent and believe the gospel. Have you repented of your sin? Have you truly put your trust in him and him alone to save you? And the Bible says that Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father except through me. Are you saved today? If you were to drop dead right now, do you know for biblical fact that you will go to heaven. The Bible says in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. He wants you to know that you know that you know that you're saved. It's not a hope so, a think so, a 99% so salvation. It's a no so. Do you know for a fact that your eternal soul is secure with him? The Bible says that having this seal, he knows those who are his. And his sheep hear his voice. Do you hear his voice? Do you know that you belong to him and he belongs to you? Well, if you don't, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Now, this prayer by itself does not save you. Jesus Christ is the one that saves you. But if you want to be saved today, want your sins forgiven, want Jesus to step into your heart and life and set you free from the power of sin, the love of sin, the habit of sin, and change your life forever, he'll do it. Pray this with me if you want to be saved today. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I cannot save myself. I believe that you went to Calvary's cross and died for all of my sins. 
past, present, and future. I believe that you rose from the dead on the third day. And Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin, and I'm asking you right now to forgive me, to save me, and to change my life forever. Now, if anybody prayed that prayer for salvation, I'll not call you out, but I want you to acknowledge you by you raising your hand. Say, Brother Dave, I pray to receive Christ in a real way today. Just simply raise your hand. All right, church. In a moment, we're going to stand. These altars are going to be open for prayer. And if God has spoken to you today, I want you to say, Lord, thank you for speaking to me. And number two, I want you to say that, Lord, whatever it is that he showed you today, whatever that may be, I want you to say, God, give me the power, give me the strength, give me the willpower to do what you told me to do in a real way. Lord, please do it for me. Do it in me and through me. And whatever it may be, maybe you're lacking willpower and you have none. Maybe, maybe, whatever it may be, man, just pray that God will motivate that. And then number three, just thank God for his love and salvation. Thank God for the incredible, awesome, unspeakable relationship that he's given and allowed you to have with him. Maybe somebody here today is saying, Brother Dave, we, we, we've been praying about joining a church and we believe that God's called us to use our gifts and our calling here. And you can come forward and I can tell you exactly how you can be a member of our church. But whatever God's done for you, this is your time and God's time. So if everyone stands under their feet, will not tarry, will not delay. What hymn? 311. 311. Hymn 311, if you'd like to sing along. This is your time and his time. Reverently bow your head in prayer to him. Come. Voice to begin. Let Jesus come into your heart. Just now, your teachings give Sister Roberta came to me and said that God laid on her heart that she felt like maybe the church could pray for me and my family. Because there is one thing we are desperately praying for. So if you could all pray for us as we pray for you, I would greatly appreciate it. So, Brother George, would you lead all of us in prayer?